And now it's time for the latest exciting episode of Doz's Television Workshop. Hello, and welcome back to Doz's Television Workshop, where today I'm looking at this thing. This is a Flutterbuster. Yes. Um, it is a power supply for your Lin LP12, which enables it to play 45 RPM records. What it basically does, I think, is it changes the mains frequency from 50 hertz to um, 50 and a bit. No, 67 is it? 67 hertz that gives you 45 RPM um, without having to alter the power supply inside the turntable. Um, yeah. I got a sneaking suspicion this was designed by the late great Tim de Baravenici. So uh, there we are. Um, it doesn't weigh anything. That's what amazes me. Um, previously, I've done heed orbits before with similar, similar thing, similar idea. Anyway, it changes the mains frequency. Um, but that uh, I did that back before I did a lot of YouTube. So it's on my website. Um, that had some faulty transistors in it. Um, this has come from my good mate Colin. Could I have a look? And being as I currently own a fiver, best I get on with it. So uh, some slotted screws, most unpleasant, into some form of lightweight wooden painted black case. Can't say I'm a lover of the design, but I uh, don't know how old it is. Hi-Fi News and Record Review Flutterbuster. HFN006. Hmm. The heat orbit basically had two transformers back to back. One to step the mains voltage down uh, where it was rectified. Um, then there was an inverter to brick it back up um, to mains frequency, uh, mains voltage, and you could select the frequency the inverter ran at. This, on the other hand, oh dear, this has seen some action, hasn't it? Look at the scorch marks around there. This is clearly, I would imagine, uh, it's just rectifying the mains, changing the frequency, and then chopping the DC back up again. Might be in class A. It's got some heat sinks on it, hasn't it? And uh, turning that back into some semblance of AC. But by the cringe, those, uh, that's been rather warm there, look. Right, um, I suppose first things first, we shall check the fuse. And then, uh, I don't like the soldering much either. Unpleasant. So, multimeter to continuity. And the mains fuse is okay. Right. So this is obviously the output socket here, and this is input. All right, oh, bulging capacitors. And you can see it's been right next to something hot. That capacitors, let's zoom in so you can see, shall we? Ooh, there we go. Yep, so this capacitor here, very much the domed top. And this one here has gone and spat its contents out of the end. What's the betting it wants a bit of a change of its capacitors and it'll all be well and good. Um, let's just get it apart, shall we? Screws are loose as well. Never a good sign. There's one in the middle there. Two at the end here. All of these screws are loose. All right, let's just see if we can ease that out. Switch on the front here, centers off. One way is 33 and the other way is 45. 
wow okay yeah that's been warm hasn't it you can see the distressed condition of the board i think whilst we're in here it may be prudent to put these resistors on some standoffs i suspect they're all right they're designed to get hot but why would you put them straight against the board like that stand them off mind you lynn did exactly the same didn't they uh we've got some dust and detritus in there Possibly because I think if you look at the patterns in the dust, it's where the heat's been drawn through it. And it's drawn the dust through it. Very unpleasant. Right. So I think my first port of call really is uh, let's get these capacitors out and see if they're up to much. Okay. That's the first capacitor. It did have a, a blob hanging out the end of it, which seems to have vanished. Uh, let's get the old ESR meter out and give that a test. Oh. Monitoring for component. That's gone open circuit. Right, okay so bad even the capacitor tester won't test it uh, the one thing that worries me is this one here because that's a 500 volt rated part chances of me having one are immensely slim let's see what it measures like yeah it's got quite a high esr it is on value for its uh, capacitance though 7.6 ohms Mm. It's getting quite quite high, isn't it, really? Uh, these are 160 volt 33 mic. Let's have a look at these in circuit. Again, 11 ohms. That's just too much. Twelve ohms. It's got a what I'm all doing, isn't it? Right. Let's uh, see what I've got in stock. What does that one measure like? That's supposed to be 4.7 as well. Open circuit. Or low capacitance. Yep. Eh, this is likely to be our issue. As long as it hasn't done any further damage, we should be good. Um... I wonder what this capacitor is actually doing. So mains comes in here, little surge limiter, fuse, bridge rectifier. All it is is the bulk uh, reservoir across the mains. Why does it need to be 500 volts? It doesn't. Um, so we could get away with a 450 in there quite easily. And that I might have. So there's hope yet. Right, let's see if I've got some 4.7s at 250 to start with. So, high voltage box. I've split the capacitors up into more than 100 volts and less than 100 volts uh, for ease of access. 4.7, Mike. Look at that. And I've even got some radials. What was that? No, axial, sorry. I always get that mixed up. 4.7 at 400, that's plenty to be going on with. Uh, what were those? Those were 33s at 160. 33s at 400, well they'll be good enough for that. More than good enough. We've also got all these little transistors uh, dotted about the place as well. So while we're in there, uh, we will probably end up changing those as well. As for my 22 mic, yeah, not going to have much in that, I don't think. Oh, unbelievably. 33 at 450. 
That's close enough. So any bit of main smoothing, that'll do us proud in there. I wonder if I've actually got enough room to sit it upright because sadly that's a, a radial part and the original is obviously axial. Uh, we can do something with that and make it all right. Uh, good, looks like this is going to be a goer. Excellent. Uh, let's put the 4.7s back in before we go mad. Just going to keep on top of things a bit. Oh, one thing I didn't look at was polarity. It isn't marked. Anyway, there's no markings on this board whatsoever. It does look like a bit of a sort of home knock-up thing, doesn't it? In fact, there's a position there. Is that on the same pad? Yes. We've provided for a different length of capacitor, which might just make my life a bit easier, actually, because it's going to be a bit tight in those front two holes, I think. Let's try it. I don't know. It's going to sit in there nicely. Okie dokie. Okay, two. Let's get these two out now. <laughs> Do you know what? I know I've got footage I can come back and look at, but uh, that involves stopping recording and making things difficult for myself. I'm just going to put black mark on the negative side of all of the capacitors I think they're all pointing the same way anyway clearly that one would be easy to work out anyway there we go it's marked them all up so I know what I'm doing now allegedly That is our replacement, so I would rather the positive lead be short and the negative one I'll extend. And what I'll do is I'll come down the side and insulate that with a piece of cat's on tape, I think. That should be adequate. Well, in the event of somebody having pinched me capped on tape, I'm going to do the next best thing. We'll have a bit of a heat shrink over it. Not quite sure whether that's going to be wide enough. I don't think it is, but we'll have a go. I could just heat shrink the lead, couldn't I? That would be a much more sensible idea. Ah, where's my head at today? We're going to want a long, sort of semi-thin bit. Ah, that looks like just the job. Right, that is probably the main offenders sorted out. We've got three little capacitors down in here. 16 volt at 10 mic. You see, I wouldn't mind if these had sort of a few ohms of ESR, but let's just have a measure. Where is it? It's in there. Yeah, 22 ohms. Another one there. And it's also down to seven mic. Everything in this board is going to be baked, isn't it? That's a bit better. Nine at 5.8 ohms. It's obviously at the cooler end of the board. 
Um, I think for the sake of completeness, I'm just going to change these out. One, two, are they all the same? 10 mic, 16 volt, 10 mic, 16 volt, 10 mic, 16 volt. Oh look, crystal controlled. <laughs> it's a colour reference crystal, 4.433. What's the other one? 3.268, is that NTSC? It would have been a cheap way to do it. Now, these resistors. I think the first thing to do is to now get this into a condition where I can safely apply power and uh, we'll just have a look and make some measurements on the output with the fluke actually because um, i can measure frequency and voltage with the fluke and it's true rms so we might be within half a chance there i'm going to use the isolation transformer um, because this could be well it's definitely all unisolated from the mains so i don't want to go poking around in there while the thing's on, that's 100% for sure. Um, in fact, I'm surprised it could get away with that switch, considering, yeah, the case isn't earthed. Metal chassis unearthed. I'm gonna have to add an earth in, I just to, uh, cause you know, what's that switch rated to? Okay, well, it is rated to 250 volts AC, so it's in the region of, isn't it? But we've got 300 odd volts of DC on here, I've no doubt, so we need to be just a little bit careful. Right, so uh, multimeter uh, to volts AC to start with. We'll just Pop that in there. These two probes do fit quite nicely in those. Uh, the isolation transformer is off. Um, yeah. So let's. In fact, there's a label on the bottom here, wasn't there, telling us which way the switch was. So we'll try 50 hertz first, which should be to the left. So that's that way. That's 50 hertz allegedly. So let's see what we get out. That's 50 hertz. That is 50 hertz. Right, because I don't trust this thing as far as I could spit it, I'm just going to power it down. We'll wait till that disappears. There we go. Okay, and I'm just going to flip that to 45 RPM. Is it 67 hertz? There you go, 67 hertz. I was in the ballpark, wasn't I? So uh, it's now working. I'm just so unhappy about these resistors. Uh, what I'm going to do is either find some replacements or actually mount them up off the board, I think. So I'm going to make some thermal improvements. Let's uh, get these resistors uh, out of here one at a time. And uh, stick little legs on them, I think. Wow, look how scorched that is underneath. Terrible. There, you can see uh, we we'll solder that back in there now. We've given it uh, quite a bit of distance so it can get a little bit of air to circulate around it and not burn the board. I'd imagine if this board starts to get scorched much more than that, you end up with a problem where the board starts becoming conductive because, um, yeah, it's basically you're making charcoal and the board is sort of fiberglass which is glue and things that are turning into carbon. 
not ideal. Right, now all I've got to do is repeat the process for the, uh, for the others. This might take a minute. A look at that the solder has actually broken away from there it hasn't taken because all that has been so cooked wow oh, I think it may have lifted the pad we shall work on that in a minute let me get this one done So this one, I'm just going to put a bit of wire in there and strap it up, I think. It's uh, not ideal. The board has just lost all its strength where it's been so damned hot. Right, let's just check that out, make sure it's good. Uh, meter to continuity. So that should be connected to that. Which it is, and also that, which it is. Yep, that's it. That's good. Right, all that, because, yeah, too much heat. 
might just put a bit of um, yeah I might just put a bit of uh, blue stuff on there where's the blue stuff what's the word I'm looking for solder mask just to sort of rejuvenate that um, part there so yeah Hopefully it won't get so hot now. You know, now it's um, we've stood the resistors up away from the board a little bit. The ultraviolet light, just to set that to cure. I want to try and get that level if I can. See if that's gone off. Yep, brilliant. Right, well that's uh, that's sorted that little problem out. Uh, where were we up to? Just the last two to go now. taken care of. We'll just uh, nip these transistor heat sinks up. That's better. And I'm thinking just a dab of nail varnish on there, stop them moving again. Ideal. Okay, right. Only one unpleasant thing left to uh, address really, and that's its lackadaisical attitude to electrical safety. We've got a board here, reference to mains, in a metal case and all that happens is the earth comes in and goes back out again never connects to the case I mean really apparently these were being built in the 90s and just no not really doesn't uh, doesn't fill me with confidence at all um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to add what's called an implicit earth uh, and I'm just gonna undo one of these screws to the uh, the IEC connector on the rear here and I'm just gonna yep no that's not gonna be the screwdriver for the job there's the iFixit again I'm just gonna um, put an implicit earth down to that point um, so we've got proper earth to the case. Uh, I'm not quite sure whether this is painted or anodized. If it's anodized, it actually the insulation isn't bad, not compliant by any means, but it's not it's not a bad insulator. Um, but it, it's not gonna it's not uh, it's not compliant. Not only that we've got all those standoffs for the PCB itself that are just dropping straight through the board. You know you could get your fingers on there quite easily and if something were to go wrong you'd get a very unpleasant shock so that's what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna 
add, I'm just going to get rid of some of that paint or whatever it is, and add another earth wire in on a tag and connect it to that. Right, let's see what this is made of. Um, what do I fancy? We'll try the fiberglass pencil first. That might just be enough just to clean through. I think it's going to be anodized, I have to say. Though I can see a scratch in it already where the screw was against the nut. I'm probably going to need a longer screw, but that's okay. It's only M3. Now I think this is anodized. Uh, we're going to need to make something more aggressive. Um, so, yeah. What have I got that's more aggressive? See if I can sort of file it, I suppose. So we've exposed clean metal there. That's good. Uh, we're going to need some M3 fittings. We need a bit of earth wire as well. Uh, M3 fittings, because I'm going to want the star washer to bite into that metal and give us a good earth against my tag. I'm going to want a bit of earth lead. Ah, oh, unbelievably, it's a bit I made earlier. In my box of bits, that'll do nicely. So I'm going to want a cheese head screw of reasonable length. Uh, that goes in that side. Nothing changes from that side really. There we go. I'm going to star wash it against the metal. I want my tag. I'm going to choose another star washer just to bite it all together. Existing nut back on. That's good. Right, we've now got a good earth on there. So I'm just going to pop the board back together, I think. Okay, line the LED back up with a hole. Sort of about there. Uh, and then I just want to basically solder that onto there. So just cut a bit of wire down. That is much improved. Tuck that out of the way. And there you go. Right. At last. Thermal things improved. Unit repaired. Electrical safety much improved. I feel much happier about this now. Uh, just got to get it back in the case. That's pretty There we go, uh, let's check its operation. Now, oh, there you have it. The Hi-Fi News HFN 006 Flutterbuster. Uh, it's been running here now for a few hours. It's been rock solid. And uh, I have to say, it hasn't electrocuted me 
or set fire to the place. So I think that's a win. Uh, thanks for watching. Click like, subscribe, do all that stuff, and I'll see you very soon here on Doz's Television Workshop. Cheers now. Bye.